Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, today, we'll have a talk by Yair Weiss, which I'm sure if you're from Huji, uh, you probably know him. Um, he's going to talk about the Bayes optimal view on adversarial examples. And this is a work with uh, Ethan Richardson, and it was recently accepted to GMLR, I think? Conditionally accepted. Oh, OK. <laughs> OK, then, um, take it away. Uh, English or Hebrew? Um, I think we have a few people that might require okay. No problem. Uh, so, Chag Sameach, everybody. Uh, and I want to uh, take the opportunity, even though uh, Elad is not here, to thank Elad for all the work he's been doing this semester. Uh, it's a lot of work running the seminar during the corona, and Elad is, thank you very much, Elad, for all your work. Okay, um, this is, uh, as Noga mentioned, work with Eitan, who's maybe also on this call. Um, probably all of you have heard about adversarial examples. Uh, this is a, a picture from uh, Zeged Yidal's paper from six years ago, where they showed that if you, you can take an image uh, of a panda, let's say, and take the best known uh, neural network classifier of that time, which was AlexNet, and add very small amounts of noise. Here the noise is magnified and you get the, this image or this image. Um, and the uh, network classifies this as a shark and this as a goldfish. Um, so since this work was published, which is again six years ago, there's been a tremendous amount of work trying to understand uh, why this happens. And I'll briefly out, uh, describe some of the controversy around this. Um, some people think it's very surprising. Some, some people think it's inevitable. Uh, the work that Aitan and I did, uh, which I'll then describe, tries to look at this effect from the standpoint of Bayes optimal classifiers, which hopefully everybody is familiar with. I just taught it this week in my uh, class. Uh, and the main uh, contribution of our work is that we've created um, image data sets that are on one hand realistic, on the other hand, uh, we have Bayes optimal classifiers which we can prove are robust to adversarial attacks. And this is interesting because it allows us now to conduct experiments uh, with neural networks when we have a gold standard. Uh, and I think it really allows us to understand better this very surprising effect. So that's what I'm planning to tell you about. Feel free to stop me uh, at any time. So yes, adversarial examples, um, since the original uh, result of Segedi, it's been really reproduced by many different people in many different networks. Uh, this figure on the top uh, is using ResNet, which is a much more modern classifier. And again, this image of an Egyptian cat uh, with really imperceptible noise, whether it's small L2 norm, small L infinity norm, or small L0 norm, meaning we only change a small number of pixels, we can make ResNet think this is a traffic light with very high confidence. So it's not really, uh, if you, maybe originally people thought that this was specific to AlexNet. We now know that all the modern CNNs uh, suffer from this, in fact, it seems, the, it seems to just be getting worse, not better. Um, it's not just image classifiers. So this is a, a neural network that is used for autonomous driving, for self-driving cars. So here the car has a video camera. This shows one frame from the video camera. And what the neural network does is it uh, computes the motion of every pixel in the camera. So uh, maybe you can see here, this is a car that's moving faster than everything else. So the network indeed correctly estimates that it's moving faster. And this is work from Ranjan from Michael Black's group. Uh, you can change a really small part of the image, you can, uh, like over here, uh, in just one frame, and the network is completely confused and it thinks every, everything is moving in all sorts of directions, uh, even though it's not. So it's not just an issue of image classification. It's really uh, seems to be a effect that you can reproduce relatively easily in almost any modern convolutional neural network. 
Of course, this has led to a tremendous amount of work on um, trying to defend, trying to fix this effect. Uh, but most of this work on design defenses has failed. So this is a quote from a paper from two years ago uh, saying there has been much work showing that basically all defenses suggested so far in the literature do not substantially increase robustness over undefended neural networks. So I think it's safe to say that this is a real effect. It's a very robust effect. Uh, it happens in a lot of networks. It's very easy to reproduce. Uh, any one of you can take one of these pre-trained networks and fool it. Um, and it's also safe to say that we don't understand what's going on. We don't really understand why it is that these neural networks are consistently fooled uh, by these very simple manipulations. And when I've given talks about this, I find that there's often um, several different, at least two camps in the way that people think about adversarial examples. Uh, these are two examples of people that some of you might know. So I was uh, in the audience when Guy Katz presented his work on adversarial examples to the president of our university, Asher Cohen. And Asher turned to me and said, wow, something is terribly wrong with deep learning. Uh, Asher, of course, is a psychologist. He's not a computer scientist. But I think anyone who, any lay person who hears about this effect is concerned. I mean, what's going on here? We're, we're counting on these networks to drive our cars, to diagnose our patients if they have cancer or not. It must be very troubling that uh, they can be fooled so easily. The other kind of uh, reaction that I've heard, this is Ronan Basri, who is a computer scientist from the Weizmann Institute, says, so what? A sophisticated thief can break into any house. So we know that if we have given adversary enough power, he can uh, hack into any system. So why are we surprised that we can hack neural networks? And it's sort of interesting to discuss why some people believe in the first. Some people are very concerned. Some people are just say, so what? This is not surprising at all. Uh, but though both of these people that I'm citing here are not experts, are not researchers in, into uh, neural networks, or, uh, but even the experts disagree. Um, if you look at the original Segedi et al. paper from 2014, they were very surprised by this effect. Uh, they asked, if the network can generalize well, <clears throat> how can it be confused by these adversarial negatives which are indistinguishable from the regular examples. So if you read their paper, they really thought that this was a puzzling, I think the title of uh, the paper was some intriguing effects about neural networks. They found it very surprising that a network that on the one hand generalizes very well. So AlexNet gives us very good performance on the test set. And yet it's fooled by these tiny perturbations that humans don't even see. Uh, Ian Goodfellow, who was one of the authors of the 2014 paper, has sort of changed his mind over the years. In the recent years, he's been pushing a, a narrative that, in fact, this is not a surprising result, and it's not just about neural networks. And in fact, any classifier in high dimensions uh, will show this effect. Uh, in a recent colloquium last year, we heard uh, Adi Shamir, this is not Ohad, this is his father, who claims that uh, Adversarial examples are a natural consequence of the geometry of Rn with the L0 metric. So we see even among the experts, we have these two field, two camps, the camp that thinks this is very surprising uh, and the camp that thinks that this is uh, uh, to be expected. The only reason it's surprising is because we don't understand the geometry of high dimensions. In fact, if I were to try to summarize the current conventional wisdom, um, this is again a work from Ian Goodfellow. I think the current conventional wisdom is it, the, what, what Ian was saying is that really, um, the, uh, I'll just quote here, this is from a recent paper, the vulnerability of neural networks to small adversarial perturbations is a logical consequence of the amount of test error observed. We're going above. Any model which misclassifies a small constant fraction of a sphere will be vulnerable to adversarial perturbations of size O of one over square root of D, that's where D is the dimension. So basically, as we go to high dimensions, 
This, this paper argues all classifiers will be vulnerable to adversarial perturbations. Uh, and this is a, another paper uh, by three co-authors with the same last name, which is quite impressive. Uh, and again, they say that um, any, um, any classification function uh, will have adversarial perturbations that transfer well across different classifiers with small risk. So any classifier that does well on the test set must be vulnerable to these tiny perturbations in high dimensions. So rather than thinking of this as some peculiar surprising effect of neural networks, we should really be understand that in high dimensions, this is a natural uh, phenomena that will occur with any classifier. And I think that's basically the current as of 2020, uh, this is the current conventional wisdom. Uh, one person who disagrees with this uh, conventional wisdom is Jeff Hinton. In fact, if you uh, look at his Turing Award talk, which is available on the web, he devotes quite a bit of time to adversarial examples. And he really thinks it's a, he's much more in the Asher Cohen camp. He thinks this is really troubling. It shows that convolutional neural networks are not solving the image recognition problem as they should be solving. And really the existence of these examples means that there's something wrong with neural networks and we should fix it. But I should say that Jeff is really now in the minority. I think the majority of people who do work on adversarial examples today would uh, believe in the first account that it's unavoidable in high dimensions. Okay, so uh, Aitan and I approach this uh, from the point of view of Bayes optimal classification and really our motivation was, well, if this is really an unavoidable property of classifiers in high dimension, then it will also be true for the Bayes optimal classifier. And that will be uh, really help the view that there's nothing wrong with neural networks because if even the best classifier falls prey to these tiny perturbations, then who are we to uh, uh, blame the uh, neural networks? So that was our thought. Let's try to understand what happens with Bayes optimal classifiers uh, as uh, in the context of adversarial examples. So what is a Bayes optimal classifier? It's a classifier that knows the two distributions. So in this case, we have two Gaussian distributions, the orange dots and the blue dots. The Bayes optimal classifier knows these two distributions. So he, he or she knows about P1 of X or P2 of X. Uh, and assuming uh, equal uh, probability priors for the two classes, the, cla the Bayes optimal classifier just says, classifies a point X, whether if it was more likely to be generated by one class than the other class. And something that we proved in the class, and I think is also proved in IML, is that this, is, this classifier has higher uh, accuracy than any possible classifier. So in this particular example, if we have this class and this class, it's easy to prove that the Bayes optimal classifier will be a linear classifier because these are Gaussian distributions and that's what's drawn here. So this uh, separating hyperplane shown in magenta, uh, in light blue, sorry, in cyan, is the best possible classifier. Uh, it classifies a point based if it's on the left side or the right side of the line. And the question we wanted to ask, will, will such a classifier suffer from adversarial examples? And as a motivating example, uh, let's not talk about points in R2, let's think about images. So here's a very simple uh, class, uh, two class problem in which we can calculate the Bayes optimal classifier. So all the images in class one are a single image with some added Gaussian noise. So these are different examples from class number one. It's all the same face with different amounts of noise. And this is class number two. Uh, it's, a, it's a different face with different amounts of noise. So this is a data set that we can create in as many possible examples as we want for, for training. Uh, and we can also uh, find the Bayes optimal classifier for this data set. Again, because these are Gaussian distribu distributions with the same covariance, uh, the Bayes optimal classifier is a linear classifier. Uh, and we can ask, will this classifier suffer from adversarial examples? Anybody want to guess? Yeah. 
No guesses. So um, just to remind you that uh, in high dimensions, uh, Goodfellow and others have argued that all classifiers that have low uh, test accuracy, a uh, high test accuracy must suffer from adversarial examples. So this is a very high dimensional example. Uh, it's optimal, so it has low test accuracy. So according to Goodfellow and others, we should be able to find adversarial examples for this classifier. Okay, um, so we, we did this, it's actually easy to calculate. So we take this image, we know what the base optimal classifier is, so we can very easily figure out what is the minimum perturbation needed to transfer this image into the other class. And this is what it looks like. Um, as you could imagine, it doesn't look exactly like the second face, but it, of course it doesn't look like the first face either. In fact, it looks like an image that is about halfway between the first and the second face. Uh, so this certainly would not qualify as an adversarial example in the sense that we saw with the ResNet. Uh, these, this is not an imperceptible change. We really, any one of us who looks at this image and this image will see the difference. These are very different images. And in order to fool the classifier, um, Yes, Daniel? Um, maybe I missed it, but what's, is there a formal definition for an adversarial example? Is there some measure to which it needs to be close to the actual example? Um, uh, yeah, so uh, it's a good question. So the way uh, people... How far can it be from the original example so that it's considered a, a adversarial example? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So the way people typically do it is they uh, is you look at the norm of the perturbation that's needed in order to fool the classifier. The smaller that norm is, the more you would call this a successful adversarial example. Uh, and sometimes you don't have a choice but actually to show it to people and ask, uh, do you see the difference? But we'll see, uh, basically what uh, most of the community does is it looks at the, at the norm. It doesn't matter if you look at the Euclidean norm or the uh, L1 norm, it doesn't. And you define some threshold and you say, if you could fool the classifier with a change that's less than that threshold, that's a successful adversarial example. And the threshold should be set so in a way that a uh, perturbation of this size is something that humans won't notice. And that's certainly not the case here. The perturbation is, is big enough that I'm sure you can see the difference between this image and this image. Yes? Yeah, I know. So, so that was my question exactly about that threshold and how can we set it. So if it's just, if it's just a, a matter of uh, letting people examine it, so it's not really well defined. Yes, I think what most people would say, the, the most examples do say something like, if you can change, if the threat, you, you set the threshold to be something like, if every pixel is between one and 256, if you can do it by changing every pixel plus or minus one or two, somewhere in that region, then that would be imperceptible. If, uh, if you have to make much larger changes, then it's not imperceptible. But you're right that uh, it's a degree thing. So what, we, what we'll show in the graphs is we actually just show the numbers without putting them through thresholds. The larger the adversary needs to uh, work, the less successful is as an adversarial example. Yeah. You can yes, Lee. Um, is this uh, an adversarial example a function of the uh, classifier or is it a function of the data? So in other words, I mean, what happens if you train ResNet on this exactly. problem? Excellent with... question. That's the next slide. Okay, <laughs> thanks. So now we take uh, the same uh, data set and we train a neural network uh, we can generate as many images as we want uh, for the two uh, classes, and we train a convolutional neural network, and we ask uh, how brittle uh, will the classifier be? So we trained it. Uh, here's a test image, and this is the adversarial example. So hopefully this answers, uh, I, I don't know who asked the question earlier about uh, um, the threshold, I think any of us who looks at these two images, we don't really see a difference. They look the same because the changes here are very, very small. Every pixel was changed by 
uh, on average, something like one over 256. So we really don't see the difference. Whereas if you look at the uh, base optimal classifier, the changes were much larger uh, and perceptible. Does this answer your question, Lee? Uh, yes, thank you. So I can't hear you, you can speak louder. Okay, show me what you have. Okay. Okay, no. גוגל פרסמו מזמן על הצלחה מאוד גדולה עם עבודה עם רשתות attention לביצוע של קלסיפיקציה של תמונות. השאלה אם בדקו את זה על משהו, כי אחד האנשים שהתנגדו לזה אמר שיש בעיה בקונבולוציות, שהוא חושב שיש בעיות עם רשתות CNN. השאלה אם בדקו את זה גם על רשתות שהן לא CNN בעצם. on this data set. Yeah, that's the question? Okay, yeah, video. Uh, not on this particular data set, but uh, others have claimed uh, that you get similar effects with other classifiers, but we haven't trained it. On this particular data set, the only thing we did train, which is I'm gonna show here, is uh, we don't need to do the base optimal classifier. A very simple generative classifier is you learn mu one and mu two by taking the mean of all the images, and then you will calculate the base optimal classifier as if these were the means. And that also gives the same result as we saw here. This will give a very robust classifier, uh, unlike the CNNs. So in this particular data set, even though it's very simplistic, it has nothing to do, maybe it's not very realistic. It shows us that a lot of the previous claims are misleading. It's not the case that any classifier in high dimensions will be equally vulnerable to these tiny perturbations. and does seem to be very specific uh, to CNNs and the problem with the way that CNNs work. Okay. So going back to these two camps, uh, the ones that say any classifier will suffer and the Hinton camp that says, this is very specific to CNNs and we should fix it. I think this very simple toy example supports Hinton. It supports the idea that new learning algorithms are needed. But we don't want to make too much of a deal out of one particular motivating example. We want to have a much more uh, rich understanding and we want to have uh, theoretical results, not just an experiment. Uh, can I interrupt also if it, since we're- Hi, Daphne, you are one uh, office next to me, hi. <laughs> yes, um, all the two doors, three doors two down. Doors. Uh, uh, is, there is another problem with the, this, uh, claim that people cannot distinguish and the CNN uh, cannot distinguish is the same example because we're talking about two different optical systems and the other characteristic of the human eye that don't really, that it's not a linear transformation of the pixel value that's being fed to the brain. So if you applied some of the transformation that the visual system is applying to the image, just, you know, we might be seeing the differences. It might be noticeable. It's, it's a very, it's, it's, it's a, problem with this claim that I'm never fully trusted. Yes, I think uh, hopefully this will be clear. I think as much as possible, we should avoid talking about the human visual system. Yeah. Uh, when we talk about other cell examples, I agree. And I think really what we should be talking about is the distance to the, uh, to the decision boundary. I think the more robust the classifier is, you want points to be as far as possible from the decision boundary. And it doesn't matter so much which norm you use, Uh, I think we, th we, this is the, ma the mathematical statements that I'm going to prove use that definition. We don't use the human visual system as much as possible. Okay, so let me just uh, show the kinds of things we can prove. Uh, so this is uh, the same setting that we just looked at. We have two classes. Uh, they're both, the class number one has a mean mu. With some, with some spherical covariance. Class number two has a mean mu two, which is mu plus D uh, with the same spherical covariance. And we assume that uh, the variance along each dimension is much smaller than the distance. Uh, then for almost all points, the Bayes optimal classifier is robust to any perturbation smaller than the norm D over two. And this result holds in any dimension. And this is a very simple proof. So I just want to, uh, it's funny because it's so simple and yet it's a counter 
uh, example to a lot of the recent papers. So let me just give you the proof. Uh, the proof is just that the Bayes optimal classifier, because it's linear, it only cares about the projection to one particular direction. Uh, in this case, the direction is, is the difference between the two means. And so no matter what dimension we work on, the only thing that really matters is W transpose X. And this is independent of the dimension of X. This distance here will be D in one dimension. After we project it down to one dimension, uh, we'll have two one-dimensional Gaussians separated by a distance of D. Uh, so almost all points are at distance D over two from the classification boundary. So it's certainly not the case that, uh, again, the mathematical statements, going back to Daphne's question, they would say that the uh, perturbation, the size of the perturbation will go to zero as the um, dimension goes to infinity. And this is a counterexample. The size of the perturbation is a constant, no matter what the dimension is. So that's uh, what we can prove about um, this very simple uh, construction of two Gaussian classes in high dimensions. Uh, but we wanted to prove something that was much more realistic and could actually generate images that looked a bit like real images. Um, and what we did is we used previous work by Eitan, uh, where he essentially used a non, non unsupervised uh, training to learn manifolds of natural images. So we're basically assuming that rather than assuming that each of the two classes is a Gaussian high dimensions, we assume that it sits on a manifold, meaning it's a high dimensional uh, set of cloud of points where that locally is low dimensional. And we can learn such manifolds. This is again, the work that Aiton did in his previous paper. Uh, and this allows us again to sample uh, and images as many as we want. It's another way of, uh, just like in the toy example I showed you in the beginning, it's a way of generating as a tra as many training sets as we want, uh, but we can control it, control the Bayes optimality, and we can also make them realistic. So here are just some examples of the kinds of images that we generate. Again, these are synthetic images. Uh, these are examples of faces. These are examples of digits. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with GANs, uh, people now can generate more realistic images than we can, but that's not the point of this exercise. Uh, our big advantage is that we can control the and calculate the Bayes optimality, the Bayes optimal classifier, because we can calculate everything analytically, which is not the case in GANs or VAEs or all these other generative models. So these are all again fake images, but their advantage is that we generate them from a known distribution and we can control how robust the Bayes optimal classifier is. So here's the main theorem in this paper. It's the analog of what I showed earlier, but for manifolds, not for Gaussians. So if you have two, this is class one, think of this as the class of images of cats. This is the class of images of dogs. They're both some nonlinear manifold. Uh, mathematically, the fact that they're manifolds means that locally they have a Gaussian, they have a covariance, which is low rank. Uh, uh, and so this is a mathematical way of formalizing uh, this, uh, the manifold assumption. And we again have some distance D, which is the minimum distance between these manifolds. So if we take a point here and a point here, uh, what is the minimum uh, over all uh, such locally linear manifolds? What is the minimum distance? That's D. And again, we show that in any, no matter what the dimensions are of the points, uh, almost all points, the Bayes optimal classifier is robust to any perturbation smaller than D over two. So again, this is a direct analog of what we saw earlier with Gaussians. It says that for the Bayes optimal classifier, if you take a point here and you wanna move it so that the classifier is confused and thinks it belongs to this class, you need to move it by a lot. You need to move it at least a distance of D over two. Again, this is a counterexample to the results of Goodfellow and others that would claim that this distance goes to zero as the dimensionality goes to infinity, because here, regardless of dimension, uh, we have a fixed distance that you need to move in order to fool the classifier. 
And so again, we can we didn't really have to do these experiments uh, because because we have a theorem. But again, just to show you what this means, um, the images on top. He, these are two. Here are the two manifolds. Are manifolds of male faces and female faces. The images on top are the original images. Again, these are synthetic images. And the images on the bottom, on the middle, are the, the minimum change you need to make to this image in order to fool the Bayes optimal classifier. And in the bottom, these are the, this is just the difference between the two images. So in order to take this guy and make him seem female, this is the minimum perturbation you need to make. Again, if you measure the L2, it's pretty large. Uh, but I think also, if you look at these images, you see that they per perceptually, this looks like a male, this looks like a female. This is a nice example where uh, this guy had a mustache and to fool the Bayes optimal classifier, we needed to remove the mustache. Uh, this is a very subtle change. We took this female picture to make it more male looking. I'm not exactly sure what the difference was that was made. The eyes are a bit different. You can see it here and the lips are a bit different, a little bit about here and indeed becomes more noticeable. Um, so this is just a way of illustrating our theorem that you need to make on average large steps, which are d over two, in order to fool the Bayes optimal classifier. It's not a distance that goes to zero as the dimensionality goes to zero. That yeah, goes to infinity, sorry. And this is just flipping back and forth between these two things. These are male face images. These are all male faces. These are all female faces. And now these are the adversarial examples. I'll flip back and forth. Uh, small changes, these are the minimum changes uh, needed to fool the classifier, but perceptually meaningful and visible. We as humans also see this distance. It's certainly not a perturbation that has zero norm or approaches zero as we go to infinity. And now we can again repeat the question that Roy asked earlier, but in a much more systematic way. We can create many such data sets for all these data sets, we have a theoretical guarantee that the Bayes optimal classifier is robust. And now we can train CNNs uh, and ask whether they will learn a robust classifier or a brittle classifier. And just for comparison, we'll also tra train other kinds of classifiers that unfortunately nobody knows about anymore called support vector machines. Uh, that used to be what everyone used to train, but now they've sort of disappeared. Uh, so we trained also two forms of support vector machines. Just for comparison, people claim that any classifier in high dimensions will suffer. Well, we know that this is not true for the Bayes optimal classifier, but maybe there's another variant of Goodfellow's proof that says any classifier that you train on finite data will also suffer, will also be brittle to these small, tiny perturbations. So to test that, we also trained linear SVMs and RBF SVMs. And the results are very clear. Um, again, these are, uh, I'll show you pictures uh, later. So the, there's 15 different data sets here. The y-axis shows the average L2 distance, average norm required to fool the classifier. So for CNNs, this, this number was less than one. We found that in this data set, if the, if the perturbation is less than one in L2 norm, that means you won't notice it. People won't see the difference. And so, in, and I'll, I'll show you images later, in all of these 15 cases, the CNN learned the classifier that could be fooled with a perturbation less than one. And in all of these um, examples, uh, the Bayes optimal classifier could not be fooled with such a tiny perturbation. You needed much larger perturbations. So that's not surprising. It's the same thing that we saw earlier. The SVM, the linear SVM, somewhat surprisingly, could also be fooled by small perturbation, in fact, smaller perturbations than the CNN. Whereas the RBF SVM is another counterexample to the Goodfellow results because it shows that um, it cannot be fooled by tiny perturbations. This is a classifier that's learned from data, the same training data uh, that, the, that the CNN was trained on, uh, and yet it cannot be fooled by tiny perturbations. You need much larger perturbations. Yeah, do all these classifiers achieve the same uh, accuracy? Approximately. I'll show the graphs. Not exactly, but approximately. They're all about 95%. But there are small differences. 
Um, they all, and I think they all achieve 100% training on the training set. Uh, so again, just to highlight this difference, so we, this is smiling versus non-smiling. Uh, so we train, this is the base optimal classifier. So this is an example of a person who's not smiling. To fool the base optimal classifier, this is the change that needs to be made. You can see the difference here. It's very subtle, and yet you see that most of the change occurs around uh, the mouth region. Um, this is a person who was smiling. This is the minimum change needed to make it to make it uh, non-smiling. Uh, again, all the changes are around the mouth, also around the eyes, which is maybe not surprising because when we smile, it also influences what we do with our eyes. And this is just to answer some questions about the use of the L2 norm. This is the histogram of changes in pixel values that you, you need on average in order to, check, to fool the Bayes optimal classifier. So 3.14 is the minimum L2 norm, but you can see that even if you look at, if you were to look at the L infinity norm, the maximum change is very large. The L1 norm is large. The L0 norm is large. No matter which norm you use, you end up having to make a lot of pixels change by a significant amount. Again, 16 out of 256 is a big change in order to fool the Bayes optimal. This is the CNN trained on exactly the same data sets. So to go to fool the, C, the CNN that says this person is not smiling, to make it uh, smiling, this is the change you need to make, something that we as humans don't really see. Again, this person was smiling. This is not smiling as far as the CNN is concerned. And again, if you look at the histogram, almost all the pixels were changed by less than two out of 256 values. So this is really something that is within the noise of a typical camera. So it's not surprising that as humans, we don't see that difference. Uh, and the same for the linear SVM, very, very small changes are enough to fool it. But the RBF SVM is not as robust as the Bayes optimal, but it's still very robust to make it, this person look like he's smiling. Indeed, we need to change his mouth and the eyes to make this person who was smiling appear non-smiling. We again change both the eyes and the mouth and the number of pixels we need to change and the amount of we need to change each pixel is quite large. So again, going back to the question I was asked earlier about how, how do we define imperceptible, I agree that it really should be something numerically defined, but I, I hope that this convinces you that it doesn't really matter which numerical measure we use, whether it's the average change, the average pixel amount, the maximum, the L1. The fact of the matter is here we need to change a lot of pixels by a large amount, and here we can change no pixels by a large amount and still fool the classifier. OK, so uh, a typical response at uh, this, uh, this time and age for any set failure of CNNs is to add more layers and add more data sets, add more data, and add more channels. So we tried all these things. They didn't really change anything. So uh, we can, this, the y-axis is, again, the, the, the size of the perturbation needed to fool. Uh, the things up here are the size of the perturbations that you need to fool the base optimal, as we saw earlier, above three, whereas the CNN is less than one. And here we increase the size of the training examples. We see almost no change. Uh, here we increase the number of filters, almost no change. And here we increase the number of layers, making the network deeper and deeper, almost no change. So, and of course, every one of these experiments was done with, with different random initializations, uh, which suggests that it doesn't, it's not a, you know, so you, you, if you look at this, at this graph, it represents our attempts to train hundreds of different CNNs. And for all of these CNNs, the result was the same. It was always the case that they learned a, a brittle classifier, even though the base optimal one and the SVM classifiers were robust. Uh, this goes to Daphne's question about really what we, the way we should look at it, and this is what we're doing now, is we should look at these results in a two-dimensional plot. Uh, one axis is the accuracy, uh, and the other axis is the robustness. Um, and so to answer Daphne's question earlier, uh, different CNNs achieve different amounts of um, 
accuracy and robustness trade-offs. Uh, so this dashed line are different CNNs trained with different uh, trade-offs between accuracy and robustness. Uh, the RBF SVM sits over here. It's more accurate than uh, uh, robust CNN. It's more accurate and it's much more robust than the most accurate CNN. And the base optimal sits over here. Uh, it has 100% accuracy and it's very robust. Uh, and th these results are with something called adversarial training, which is a way of adding some notion of robustness to CNN training. Uh, this uh, paper won best first place out of 2,000 submissions in the, in the NIPS adversarial, uh, NeurIPS adversarial recognition challenge. So there was something like 2,000 submissions and this won the first place. And it's an algorithm that iteratively during the training keeps adding adversarial examples. Uh, and so it, this can indeed improve robustness, but it comes at a big price in terms of accuracy and still far below the RBF SVM. Okay, just the last uh, results I want to show are experiments with real data. Uh, so instead of working with the synthetic data for which we can calculate um, the uh, Bayes optimal classifier, uh, we can just work with, we, we can do the experiments comparing CNN, SVM, and RBF SVM, sorry, linear SVM and RBF SVM on, a, on any data set. We don't have to use the Bayes optimal anymore. Uh, we won't know what the best you can do, but still interesting to see whether we'll see the same trend. And the answer is yes, we see the same trend. So this is again, male versus female. Uh, this is an, um, a, a female celebrity. Uh, we train the CNN and we find the advers minimum adversarial perturbation to make the CNN think this is male. And this is the minimum perturbation needed to convince the CNN this is a female. And again, these are very, very small changes. I think you can bar barely see the difference. The same for the linear SVM. Whereas for the RBF SVM, to make this woman look like a man, we need to add a mustache. We change some things in the skin color. And again, uh, to make this male figure of pure female, we have to add some lipstick, change the cheekbones. So these are very perceptually, these are again, subtle effects because there is a minimum perturbation required, but yet they're uh, much larger and perceptually meaningful as opposed to the CNN where they're almost like very small. And again, you can see these in the numbers. So these are five different data sets. Um, the CNN numbers are on average close to three, uh, which is very large and noticeable. Uh, sorry, not the RBF. You need large perceptually meaningful changes, the CNN, tiny imperceptible changes. Okay, so we just to go back uh, and discuss what our results mean for the, uh, in terms of this debate going on. Uh, so I think our results clearly support uh, Jeff Hinton. That is all these people who are claiming um, that any classifier with small risk uh, must be uh, uh, fooled by small imperceptible perturbations. Uh, I think our results are clearly contradict that hypothesis. Uh, we are much closer to what uh, Jeff says, which says this is a problem specific to CNNs, at least in degree. Uh, the fact that you can fool it with such small perturbations uh, is very much specific to modern CNNs. Uh, and it really tells us that CNNs, as Jeff was arguing, are not correctly solving the image recognition problem. Uh, and we need to think of new learning algorithms. We shouldn't be resting back on our lawyers and saying everything is fine. Uh, there's nothing you can do. This is unavoidable. No, so there is a problem here. We need to fix it. Uh, and this is actually an opportunity for those of us working in machine learning to do something better. Um, just to, a bit about uh, the thoughts of why this happens and what we can do to fix it. I think here's an, a nice example to think about. Um, again, we used to show these plots in, in, in IML. If you have a data set that looks like this, um, if you look at this red classifier, 
it perfectly classifies the data. In fact, it will also give you almost 100% accuracy on the test set. So if I were to sample new examples from these two narrow Gaussians, I would still get uh, accuracy that's very close to 100%. Uh, but yet, almost all the points here are very close to the decision boundary. So the margin of this classifier is small, uh, whereas this blue, um, light blue classifier is the max margin solution. And here, uh, this is exactly what linear SVM would find. Uh, so in that sense, this is not such a new uh, phenomenon in machine learning. We've, we've worked a lot about margin of classifiers. We know that if we want uh, to find this classifier, it's not enough to just uh, do SGD on the accuracy. That's not on the test set, on the train set. That will not guarantee that we find this classifier. We need to add another term. Um, so there's been some recent arguments that Actually, if you run SGD on this on the linear classifier, such as the one I'm showing here, it will eventually converge to this classifier. Uh, in fact, I did this experiment. That's true, but it can take a very, very long time. In fact, exponential time uh, in deep networks. Uh, and so in practice, I think we, we this is not true. It's not enough to use SGD and to, uh, hope that this will magically lead us to the max margin solutions. We need to much more actively uh, try to force our classifiers to find this uh, and not re rely on some sort of implicit regularization that happens as, as a result of SGD. And that's uh, in terms of uh, future work. Um, I just this week was happy to learn that we have a grant with Francis Bach that was uh, approved where we're going to work on algorithms that explicitly try to enforce margin constraints in machine learning. Okay, but let me end uh, here. Um, there's this very intriguing effect of uh, adversarial examples. I hope one thing you take from this uh, talk is that it's, uh, this, this effect happens with a lot, large number of classifiers uh, not just AlexNet, many different problems are all susceptible to these tiny perturbations. The main result from our paper is that the Bayes optimal classifiers are provably robust uh, for certain distributions, even in high dimensions. So don't be fooled by all these papers that tell you that high dimensions are different from low dimensions. Of course, that's true, uh, but that doesn't mean that any classifier in high dimensions will be uh, susceptible to tiny perturbations. That's we have counterexamples that are provably robust even in high dimensions. For these same conditions, we found experimentally that CNNs consistently learn a brittle classifier, while RBFSVM trained on exactly the same data learn a robust classifier. Uh, we see a similar trend in real data sets. And I guess one way to summarize all of our talk is that deep learning is not magic. Thank you very much. Everybody, I think uh, let's um, unmute ourselves and uh, thank um, Yael for a really amazing talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, I have a question. Well, you go ahead and then I'll. Okay, thank you. Um, so, here, here's my kind of naive take on, on this. Um, the way I think about deep learning methods is that they're very good at capturing uh, low level correlations. They might find kind of a combination of pixels that we as humans cannot uh, observe. And this, uh, I mean, this is maybe the simplest thing that they can find uh, that separates the data perfectly. And um, as, I mean, you kind of said, I mean, we don't want to think about it the way humans do, but I mean, inevitably, this is how we judge that. Uh, I mean, it's not exactly how you judge because you, should, you also use a, a numeric criterion. But I mean, we, we basically, the, one of the main evidence is for us, this looks exactly the same. But maybe for the model, if you if there's a combination of five or 10 pixels that is 100% indicative of the true class and you changed it, and we don't see the difference, but the model does. So. Um, 
my question is, I mean, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, obviously, um, maybe a, a naive base classifier, a, a, an optimal base classifier, sorry, is unable to capture this, and that's why it's capturing other things that are more robust. Uh, or maybe, uh, so maybe one thing to do is to think about the data that we use and maybe train, I don't know, um, train on more noisy examples such, a, such that low level features are not easily uh, used to distinguish between different classes or I don't know, happy to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I think, again, I, I think we wanna avoid as much as possible um, thinking about the human visual system. So just if you look at this example, again, which we used to show in IML classes, it, there's nothing, about, you don't need to know anything about human vision to say that the red cl classifier is not as good as the blue classifier. Uh, really, robustness, you can define it in a way that you want uh, the minimum change you want to make to the decision boundary to be as large as possible. And so this says, this says nothing about human vision. Uh, and yet CNNs are failing in this criteria. Uh, so I think there is a way to define their failure, uh, which says nothing about human vision. Of course, this is still agrees with what you're saying is that they are finding a very small number. They're, they're finding something like this red classifier. They're finding a small number of they're finding a classifier that bases all of its performance on the subset of the features. And then when we just change these features, that's enough for us uh, to change the, class, change the classification boundary. So I agree with that part of your talk that this is of your question. Uh, so it's certainly a good way to think about this is that what they're doing is finding a classifier that perfectly separates the data, uh, but is basing its classification only on a small subset of the features or some linear combination of the features, where I disagree is I don't think that this, uh, you to talk about this as being bad, you don't need to talk about the human visual system. Uh, it's enough to say that we want our classifiers to be as robust as possible, and then we want to maximize margin. Uh, and that's indeed what uh, the work that I hope to do with Francis is going to do. Just for the second part of your question, just uh, this idea of introducing adversarial examples during training is uh, what won this class competition. That's this algorithm, Zhang et al. 2019. That's exactly what they do is you train a classifier, you generate adversarial examples. Uh, you add those adversarial examples to the training examples and you keep, keep iterating. Uh, and those do improve robustness. Uh, they're very slow. You know, they're about a hundred times slower than training the original thing because at every iteration you have to keep uh, doing this uh, but, and, but, and they also seem to be suboptimal in that they, uh, we can do much better with an SVM. But certainly that does seem like a good direction uh, to go, but you want to be able to do it much more efficiently uh, than this loop, inner loop, which is very, uh, uh, very costly in resources going back to your, your recent work. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think my question is related to Ray's actually. Um, there are different kinds of adversarial attacks and some uh, one, one, uh, one limitation that people like Adi Shamir put is the number of pixels you're allowed to change. So a lot of small changes is, is one of the easiest way to generate an adversarial image. image. If you limit the number, it's a, it gets a little harder to make it unnoticeable. And did you also did this comparative study on when they say the number of pixels that are allowed to change is limited? Is it still such a big difference? Yeah, so uh, that's why I sh we showed these plots. Um, it looks like no matter what you use, so what, what, again, I'll explain what you see here on the X, this is the histogram of the changes that need to be made to fool the Bayes optimal. And this is the histogram of the changes that need to be made to fool the CNN. And the actual uh, algorithm here limited the L2 norm. So it, it keeps going. The algorithm was not trying to limit the L1 norm or the L infinity norm, but in fact, it limited all of them. So the change you need to make to fool the CNN is basically uh, less than one over 256 for almost all the pixels. So it's, it has low L2 norm, low L1 norm, low L infinity norm, uh, whereas the... Uh, amount of change you need to, to fool the base optimal is high in all these different norms. So we didn't see any difference 
uh, whether you use this norm or that norm in comparing the classifiers. Of course, you know, all these norms are uh, bounds for the other kinds of norms, so that's not surprising, but we didn't see an effect there that if you use L1 norm versus L infinity norm, no matter how you measure it, it's tiny for the CNN and large for the RBF. Can I ask a question? I a question. Yes, Why? go ahead, Leo. Uh, so, Sensei, it, it was uh, very interesting. Back, to, back in your uh, manifold uh, example, um, we, we saw that the, the linear SVM uh, is not enough, and the the, the RBF uh, was good, and the uh, and the CNN was was also brittle, right? So I I mean, there are two two things here, I think to think about. One is the um, like the linear classifier in the end, right? Where and there you have a, a strong dependence on on the margin, but of the of the features or something of the representation. Could you just speak up, you I can barely hear you. Sorry, can you hear now? Yes. Okay. I'm. I'm. What I'm trying to ask is about uh, maybe there are two components here. One being uh, the features um, on, and, and the, the other one being the, the linear classifier on top of them. So, and the reason I'm I'm thinking in this direction is the the difference that you showed bet, uh, between the linear and the RBF SVM uh, comparing to the CNN. So. Uh, Maybe one way to ask this is, okay, if you take the CNN and you try just to use its, uh, its features in the end and train an SVM on these features. Now, ov obviously the training is it's all connected because it's trained end to end and so on. But, but still maybe, because so the, the, linear, the linear classifier was, was not enough and, and maybe this is because, okay, the, the manifolds are not linearly separable, but, but in this, uh, in your example, the, the random features like from the RBF were, were, was enough. So, I mean, is the problem with the CNN that it's uh, something with the classifier, like, like you were arguing in the last, uh, in the last slide, that it learns a, a bad classifier, or maybe it just generates um, kind of bad features for this, uh, with which you, you don't get a good margin? Does, does this so, yeah, it's a long question, but <laughs> I'll try to... First of all, um, I think... It's good to remember also this example. So here the base optimal was linear and uh, linear SVM would also find a robust classifier while the CNN here fails. Right. So it's right, but I'm asking about the manifold case. Yeah, yeah, but just to, in case, because uh, one of the early Goodfellow papers claimed that uh, oh, linear, cla it's, linear classifiers are always uh, more uh, susceptible to adversarial examples than nonlinear ones. And this is a counterexample to that claim. Uh, it yeah. really depends on distribution. But um, for, for these experiments, you're right that the linear SVM here uh, does not also ends up learning a very uh, non robust classifier. But, and we think this has to do, we're trying to investigate this more. We think it has to do with uh, the fact that it can't really, the, the, the base optimal one is very nonlinear. Yeah. And so, it, you know, it can't really approximate it. So it's doing some weird thing where it has to be close to the decision boundary. Whereas the RBF SVM can do nonlinear stuff. So it is also robust. Uh, and one of the reviewers was saying, well, maybe that explains why the CNN is not succeeding here because it doesn't have enough modeling power, expressive power to model the Bayes optimal uh, decision boundary. We don't think this is true. That's why we did these experiments with a more depth with so many layers in such a high depth, uh, the CNN can do anything. It, can, can do, it has enough expressive power to express very nonlinear classifiers, and yet it still learns a brittle classifier. Yeah, I, I, I understand that, and I agree. What, what I'm trying to ask is, do you have any intuition or results about the reason that the CNN fails to do this? So. Uh, I, there are perhaps there are two uh, options here. One is that the transformation it applies to, maybe you cannot separate between them, but, but still. One is that the, the, the transformation to the representations is not good enough and you end up with something uh, that you still cannot do with linear classification in the end. 
And the other one is that, no, you get very good representation, but, but the linear classification part of the CNN is somehow broken because like, like in the linear, yeah, something like this. Yeah, it could be. Again, I think a good thing to think about for this question is, is really this original data set, the much, this data set over here, uh, where the CNN was perfectly capable of representing a linear classifier because the final layer here is fully connected. So if it wants to learn the linear classifier, it can, and yet it doesn't. It instead chooses this very weird non-robust classifier. Uh, so again, we cannot, it's not a matter of expressive power, uh, but you're right that it feels like there should be a way to, um, to encourage the CNN to learn the more robust classifier maybe by changing the inputs in some way, maybe by adding some regularizer. Uh, hopefully there's something we will figure out, so, some, the community will figure out as we move forward. I think the, the strong statement I'd like to make now is today's state of the art learning methods. Again, we used Atom, we used all the standard machinery that people use. It doesn't do it. It consistently learns time and time again. It learns a non-robust classifier, even though a robust one exists and it has enough expressive power to represent the robust classifier. Okay, thank you. Okay, and I think that's all about all the time we had for today. So all the other questions, yeah, I'm sure Yayo would love to take them offline. So thank you again for a really wonderful talk and I hope to see everyone next week. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye.